There's something deeply wrong with the way we build homes today. When the power goes out at minus 40, modern walls go cold in hours. The furnace dies, the pipes burst, and by dawn, your house feels more like a freezer than a home. Yet 800 years ago, people lived through nights far colder than this. Snow sealed their doors shut, wind tore at the roof, but inside their log cabins, no fire burning, no electricity humming. The air stayed warm enough to sleep. They didn't fight the winter with machines. They built houses that understood it. Every log, every joint worked with the cold, not against it. Eight centuries ago, they solved a problem we still can't. And maybe the question isn't how they built, but what we forgot. Outside the valley, howls. Snow stacks on the roof like white stone. The sky is iron, the wind keeps score against the walls, and every gust says the same thing. Winter wins if you build wrong. Inside this cabin, the light is the color of embers. Pine breath, dry wood, quiet. We are somewhere in Northern Europe, the high forests that fed the Alps and the Carpathian ridges. People here learned to live with minus numbers on the wrong side of the thermometer. No HVAC humming in the background. No fiberglass stuffed in hollow walls. Just timber hand cut and hand fitted and the older memory of how to make a room keep breathing warm air till morning. Here's the logic that made that possible. First, thermal mass. Thick logs hold heat the way a battery holds charge taking in the fire's energy and releasing it slowly through the night. Second, airtight joinery. Scribe fit logs and moss chinking stop the draft before it starts because leaks kill warmth faster than cold does. Third, radiant heat in a compact space. A hot core, low ceilings, small doors, and the body stays warm because the surfaces glow, not because the air is overcooked. This is not nostalgia. It is physics made with an ax and patience. Remember the rule. They did not fight the cold. They designed with it. The modern house looks solid. It feels safe. Straight lines, triple glazed windows, digital thermostats, glowing blue. But pull the plug, cut the power on a winter night, and the truth shows fast. When it's minus 20 outside, the average home in North America drops below freezing in six hours. Six hours. That's the time between dinner and dawn. By morning, your house feels more like a walk-in freezer than shelter. R25 insulation looks great on paper, but paper doesn't trap heat. It just slows the loss. Fiberglass, drywall, vinyl siding, lightweight layers built for speed, not endurance. These walls don't hold heat. They just keep air busy. There's no thermal battery, no heavy mass to store the fire's breath. The moment the furnace stops, warmth starts bleeding through the hollow walls. Minute by minute, the temperature slides. Then comes the silence, the kind you can feel in your teeth. The hum of machines fades, the boards creak as they shrink, and the cold starts walking through the house like an old debt being collected. You can almost feel the warmth escaping like breath through a cracked window. Modern houses are designed for comfort, not survival. They depend on power gas and constant motion. Cut the cord and they die. The builders of the past didn't rely on wires or vents. They relied on physics. They understood weight density and how slow moving heat keeps life inside walls. We traded that knowledge for convenience, for speed, for profit. Maybe that's the real design flaw. We stopped building homes. We started manufacturing boxes. At the edge of a frozen field, an old craftsman runs his knife along a pine log. The blade catches, then releases with a soft crack, the sound of dry wood meeting cold air. He listens to it the way a doctor listens to a heartbeat. To him, that sound means strength, not weakness. It means the log is ready to hold warmth. This was old growth pine trees that had seen a century of storms before they were cut. 80, sometimes 120 years old. Tight rings, heavy resin, dense grain. Each cubic foot of that wood weighed around 37 pounds and could store more than 8,000 BTUs of heat. When you built walls from that, you weren't just keeping weather out, you were storing fire inside. A modern house treats heat 
like something to be contained. But medieval builders treated it like something to be harvested slowly, patiently, over time. They didn't talk about insulation, they talked about storage. Each wall was a slow battery charging through the day when the fire burned, releasing its warmth long after the flames were gone. In one Norwegian study, a traditional log cabin was left unheated at minus 30 degrees. 48 hours later, the inside temperature was still 45. That's not magic. That's mass. Wood so dense it slows the movement of cold and delays the escape of heat. The walls don't just block temperature, they breathe it in, then exhale it back. It's a different kind of intelligence, not digital, not mechanical, but physical. The builders didn't have thermometers or blueprints. They had seasons. They knew how sound travels through frozen pine, how moss swells with moisture, how fire talks to stone. Every decision came from watching nature long enough to imitate it. That's the part we forgot. They didn't insulate. They accumulated. They built homes that acted like living bodies, drawing heat in holding it close and letting it go only when the night was ready. Here is how the system actually worked piece by piece, the way a craftsman would explain it to his son by the fire. First, thermal mass and log density. A medieval wall was not a sandwich of thin layers. It was one thick body of wood, 12 to 14 inches of old pine stacked and locked. Each linear foot of that log weighed around 80 pounds. That weight matters. It slows heat down. It creates a thermal lag of 12 to 18 hours, which means the wall charges while the fire burns and then pays you back all night long. Put that next to a modern drywall partition that weighs maybe 10 pounds per linear foot. The drywall has almost no momentum. The moment the furnace stops, the temperature dives. In the cabin, it moves like molasses. Slow. Predictable. You could place your hand on the wall and feel yesterday's fire still breathing. Not hot, not cold. Alive. The point is simple. Light walls insulate air. Heavy walls store energy. Storage beats resistance when the lights go out. Second airtight joinery and moss chinking. Warmth dies through leaks faster than through conduction. So they treated air like a precious thing. The logs were scribed fit each course, cut to match the one beneath it, not by guesswork, but by hours of knife marks and chalk lines. This was patience turned into geometry. Then the seams were packed with a living gasket moss clay, sometimes goat hair. Those fibers swell a little when damp and shrink when dry, so the seal renews itself through the seasons. Wind hits and there is nowhere to go. That is why some 600-year-old cabins still test at air tightness levels rivaling passive house standards. Built by patience, sealed by touch. No foam cans, no plastic membranes. Just fit and seal fit and seal until the wall behaves like one piece. Third, radiant heat and zoning. Open fireplaces look romantic, but they send most of the heat up the chimney. Medieval builders preferred mass heaters. Masonry cores often soapstone ovens that take a short, hot burn and then radiate for hours. One two-hour firing can deliver steady surface temperatures above 150 degrees for 16 hours. That is not conjecture. It is measured performance. The trick is that radiant heat warms people and objects first, not the air. When the surfaces of the room are warm, your body feels warm at a lower air temperature. That is free efficiency. Now put that heater in a compact plan. The central room stays the warmest. Sleeping rooms run cooler. Ceilings drop to about six and a half feet, so heat does not pool above your head. Doors and passages stay small to keep the warm zone contained. Heat the people, not the air. Zone the warmth the way you would zone light, with a lantern bright where you live dim where you pass. Together, those three layers form a self-defending loop. Mass slows the loss. Air tightness chokes the leaks. Radiant heat aims the warmth at bodies and stones instead of wasting it in the air. You burn less fuel. You sleep warmer. You last longer when the grid fails. None of it is magic. All of it is physical, weight, fit, glow. That is the system behind survival, and there is a human rhythm to it. 
You cut heavy. You fit tight. You fire hot and short. You let time do the rest. That rhythm turns a pile of logs into a winter you can live through. When people say, these cabins beat modern homes, this is what they mean. Not style, not nostalgia. A set of decisions that make heat behave like a quiet companion, not a runaway expense. If you remember nothing else, remember this mass to hold seals to protect radiant to comfort. The cold can hammer on the door all at once. Inside the wall still breathes yesterday's fire. Here is what the numbers look like when winter stops being theory and starts knocking on the door. 40 below outside, 46 degrees inside, no fire, three nights, still warm. They built warmth into the walls. That is not a slogan. It is a measurement. After the last burn, the cabin coasts on stored heat. The walls hold the charge, the stone keeps radiating, and the air stays livable while the storm does its worst. In side-by-side -side tests, a traditional log and mass setup used roughly one-tenth of the fuel, a modern forced air home burned to reach the same comfort. One-tenth. Less chopping, less hauling, less paying. Because the system wastes almost nothing, heat goes into mass, mass returns it to people and drafts have nowhere to run. Watch how it plays out over time. Hour six, the modern house is already below freezing without power. Water lines are at risk. Hour six in the cabin surfaces are still warm to the touch and the core room holds steady in the 40s. By hour 24, the drywall shell is a refrigerator. The log cabin is a slow oven. By hour 48, you can sleep. Not cozy like summer, but human and safe. The proof is simple. Heavy walls, tight seams, radiant core. It is the kind of efficiency you can feel with your hands, not just see on a chart. And once you feel it, you stop asking whether the old way works. You start wondering why we ever forgot. After World War II, we changed how we built. Speed became king. Suburbs went up overnight. Cheap lumber, cheap drywall, cheap vinyl, and cheap oil kept the machine humming. If you could heat a light box with a big furnace and endless fuel, why bother with heavy walls and patient joinery? We stopped building for survival. We built for convenience. On paper, the new system looks smart. Codes focused on R value, a single number that measures how much a wall resists heat flow in a steady lab condition. But R value is a snapshot. It tells you about resistance in the moment. It does not tell you about time. It does not tell you about mass. A hollow wall with a high R value can slow heat for a while, then dump it fast the second the furnace stops. A heavy wall with a lower R value can store heat and release it slowly for hours. That is the difference between comfort on the grid and survival off it. Think about it like this. Modern walls resist heat. Ancient walls embraced it. Modern design tries to hold warmth at arm's length like something that has to be managed. Medieval design invited warmth into the structure, into the logs and the stone, so the building itself became part of the heating system. When fuel was cheap, we could paper over that mistake. Today, with fragile grids and harder winters, the bill comes due. The physics never changed. We just stopped listening. The medieval builder wasn't primitive. He was a physicist with an axe. He didn't need a calculator to understand balance. He had winter for that. Centuries of cold nights taught him what most of us have forgotten. Heat needs mass. Air leaks are the enemy. Radiant beats forced air. And slow building always outlives fast decay. Those weren't theories. They were laws written by survival. Every mistake was paid for in frostbite or hunger. Every success meant another night alive. That kind of knowledge doesn't come from comfort, it comes from consequence. Today we talk about efficiency and smart homes, but they talked about endurance. Their intelligence wasn't digital, it was practical, simple, quiet. The kind you feel in your hands and bones. They didn't optimize, they endured. They didn't measure warmth in degrees, they measured it in time. Warmth isn't comfort, it's survival. And patience built it. Tonight, our homes glow with screens and hum with power. But pull the plug, and the silence feels ancient. 
We've built a world that only works when the grid does. The medieval cabin didn't need permission to stay alive. It knew how. Woodstone, moss, and fire, each part speaking the same quiet language of survival. Those cabins still stand in the snow, their walls darkened by smoke and time. The fire inside them burns small but steady. It doesn't chase comfort, it protects life. When the world goes cold again, it won't be technology that saves us. It will be knowledge, the kind written in calloused hands and measured in patience, not in watts or apps. They didn't fight the cold, they worked with it.